Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to MNP World Talk Show. We hope you are having a wonderful Lunar New Year celebration. Today, we have invited uh, the Ambassador of India to Mongolia, His Excellency Mr. Mohinder Pratap Singh. So, Thank you, Sanbano. It's a pleasure for me and an honor for me uh, to be joining you today at the studios uh, as we commemorate uh, the Lunar New Year. Sagansar celebrations in Mongolia. My greetings and warm wishes to all of your viewers and to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for accepting our invitation. It's a pleasure for me and sir. always a pleasure uh, to, be, to be talking to uh, young friends like you. Thank you. So, since it's the new Lunar New Year, would you like to... Yeah, that's the tradition which uh, I picked up after coming here. It is really interesting to see other people sn uh, sniffing bottles. So, would you tell, uh, kindly tell the history of where did you get this? Well, first of all, I'll tell you a very interesting uh, story before I tell you about the snuff bottle. Where did I get it? The best is the snuff inside my bottle and the snuff inside your bottle is most likely to be from India. As for the snuff bottle, uh, I got it uh, near the Gandhan uh, monastery when I came here. There is a place where I normally go for picking up uh, uh, things of uh, my artistic interest like horses, like camels. And one day I found the bottle and I brought it with me, more as a souvenir. And I never thought I'll be using it today when I meet you at the Lunar New Year. So thank you very much really for giving me this honor. I've uh, only heard from... Uh, you know, movies made during the socialist era that the Indian powder was the best ones, and uh, all of Mongolians sought it. So. It still is. Yeah, I it still is. I can tell you from my personal experience uh, that at least I know of uh, a few ministers and a few members of parliament who specially get the Indian snuff from India. And there are a few places, one place is uh, in, in the south of India called uh, Karnataka, which is very famous, and another place uh, is up north. So people used to get it from there and I think still they get it. Let's uh, get into our main questions sure. for today. So, you first visited Mongolia in 1999. So, uh, uh, what was, was your <laughs> first impression when you came to Mongolia? And would you kindly tell us about the history of how you come to Mongolia? I don't think. Were you born in 1999? Uh, yeah, I was three years old. <laughs> <laughs> so, I came to your beautiful country uh, when you were just two years old. And I accompanied uh, uh, my Vice President, Mr. Krishan Kant, who came here on a bilateral state visit. And I still remember, uh, you know, Mongolia, or rather I would say Ulaanbaatar, was not the place that I have seen it today. It was a quaint place, uh, I would say dull, idyllic, uh, I would say more closer to the nature. And there was uh, nothing like uh, the Shangri-La Hotel or any right. such things around here. And if I recall, uh, there were only dusty roads and one main road that led from the National Library on to the Sukhbatar Square and coming on to the Beijing Street the and all. Avenue. And then uh, we had, uh, if I recall, I'm not too sure, uh, recall, there were just two hotels, Ulaanbaatar and Bayongol. Bayongol. Yeah, those were yeah, the hotel. Main hotel and, um, and you can imagine Mongolia of those it's days. A, uh, back in but those days, it, it was die. as beautiful. The sky uh, infatuated me, you know, it's a blue sky clean uh, uh, surroundings, uh, nice people, hospitable people, warm people, a great affection towards India and uh, there was a great, uh, I would say, deference to our shared common heritage of Buddhism and the then ambassador uh, Kushak Pakula Rinpoche 
uh, who was called uh, teacher ambassador by Mongolia and he was here for almost 10 years uh, uh, in Mongolia, was instrumental in reviving uh, this shared heritage of Buddhism and uh, not only in reviving the heritage of Buddhism but also uh, uh, reviving and establishing uh, more than 300 monasteries across Mongolia. So yeah, uh, you uh, took me back into those uh, good memories uh, uh, where you could see, but people uh, were the best part of it. Your hospitality was fabulous. Uh, I would say protocol was exemplary, and, uh, uh, and 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 whatever came in conversation came from the heart. So I felt uh, the instant bonding, but I never thought that I'll be. Uh, posted to this place as ambassador uh, and it is my good fortune that I come here at a time when I'm seeing this transformed nation uh, altogether transformed yet right. retaining its uh, old spirits and heritage uh, and the customs uh, like the one which we had just now. So you have returned to Mongolia after 20 years. So during those 20 years and before that you must have visited and worked in many different countries. Yes I did. So, uh, would you kindly tell which country you know touch your heart the most, and what, which country's culture and tradition, and maybe even cuisine you like the most? That's something of an interesting question that you asked me. Uh, well, uh, during the course of my uh, uh, service in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I worked in different capacities in different missions. Uh, but more than that, I worked as uh, as, as the deputy. Uh, Chief of Protocol and a Protocol Officer in the Ministry of External Affairs and a part of which entailed that I would be responsible for making arrangements, organizational setup for the visits abroad of uh, our President, Prime Minister and Foreign Minister and also to handle the visits of uh, foreign heads of states, uh, kings and queens to India including foreign ministers. And that part of duty took me to about 107, including Mongolia, countries. Where, countries. And I count 107 those countries where I have slept at least one night. <laughs> wow. But in terms of uh, my service, I, this is my seventh posting. So your question is, uh, which country? It's a very difficult pick. You know, if you look at the geographical stretch that I have covered, uh, but I say, uh, deep within, I am a natural, nature-loving person or a person who likes to be uh, in the surroundings where uh, nature beckons me. Um, of course, I, it's, I'm not saying that uh, the comforts of modern world are something that I don't like, but uh, nature is something that remains close to my heart. Uh, so immediately, if I were to pick, uh, I would be very happy to say that uh, in my interview with one of the uh, one of the magazines when I arrived here, I said Mongolia continues to be the last bastion of untamed nature. What you could see the nature I have been to after half of Africa, so you have the wildlife. Uh, so you have been to uh, Amazon forest, Brazil, uh, right. and down Argentina. So you see another aspects uh, of forest. But when you come here to Mongolia, you see practically everything. You know, if you start moving from the western Mongolia, go to, to the, the south uh, Gobi, then come down to the central part, you have different feel, different uh, attraction, Biomes. different, uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. And um, I also uh, feel uh, that uh, this is uh, what I think uh, I qualify as one of the best uh, posting when I am much close to the nature, the air you breathe, the blue sky that you see, the sunshine that you see despite uh, minus 40 temperature outside. Well, uh, that, that warms my heart. And if you were to ask me other countries, well, uh, uh, other country that I liked most was the Austria. Austria? Yeah. Right. And Austria again uh, has something if you have seen those paintings where you see a lake, the mountains, the people, the boat, of a small jogging track, it has a bit of everything. And uh, I think, uh, uh, like Mongolians, uh, I can't say Australians are as warm as Mongolian, but yes, they make you comfortable uh, as friends. Uh, but in terms of nature, yes, that part, uh, that part also, 
attracts me the most. So I would say yes, Mongolia and Austria. Yeah, that's wonderful to hear. Well, uh, my daily routine uh, begins uh, normally at around 6.30. Uh, that is uh, when I take, uh, I get up and take my dogs to the walk. And after I bring them back, I do a bit of uh, yoga and stretching for about 40 odd minutes. And uh, that uh, gets me, you know, a bit of, a, how do I say, energy or energetic uh, uh, way to start my day. Uh, then uh, there's a little prayer that I say in my prayer room upstairs uh, for a few minutes. Basically, I want to uh, I want to be with myself. I want to mull over as to what uh, uh, you can say spiritually or even otherwise. Uh, I, I look up and recount uh, my blessings. Uh, and yes, uh, after the breakfast, I come down here. Uh, and start my work. Uh, well, COVID has impacted a uh, lot of flow of visitors, but uh, in the normal times, we will have a schedule of visitors coming in. Uh, our embassy issues uh, visas, uh, take applications for the scholarships, uh, facilitates uh, uh, business relationships, uh, meeting businessmen. And for me, uh, I meet some of them. Uh, uh, the business people or the academics. Uh, and then it also involves uh, visiting uh, uh, different institutions for different purposes, whether it is to bilaterally uh, promote our relationship with them, uh, whether institutes or business houses, chamber of commerce. And yeah, uh, coming back, uh, then I do a bit of a reading, catching up uh, on the news uh, internationally because of the time difference. Uh, between uh, various continents uh, uh, and of course sending dispatches and all. So yeah, it pretty much sums up uh, uh, all. It may look like very simple, but you know, when you start doing uh, the work uh, for, for, for any ambassador, I'm not saying for me, uh, you know, to be uh, performing your duties uh, to the best of abilities in this complex and challenged world where there is a multitude of uh, uh, issues that you need to deal. Uh, there is uh, what I call uh, the challenge for uh, ambassador is the infodemic. You would have heard the word pandemic, but I say infodemic. Infodemic is in today's age and time, there is too much information about uh, everything on this earth, be it a mundane thing like uh, how do you wash your hands or to a complex things like uh, uh, how uh, US policy towards South China Sea would evolve and impact the world. So yeah, uh, you have to glean, you have to filter, you have to sieve the relevant information, uh, the con put it contextually whether it helps you in your work or it helps you uh, uh, take forward uh, your own uh, goals. Uh, that is uh, important. and. Uh, uh, the other thing which as ambassador we need to do is become an expert of almost everything, be it disarmament, be it space technology, be it information. Uh, I wouldn't call it a jack, but I would say we become somewhat of an uh, informed uh, uh, narrative uh, needs to be built up, uh, putting it contextually in the relationship of uh, our two countries. So yeah, uh, that we all do. And uh, a little bit of a winding that I do is uh, in the evening I do my jogging, uh, walk my dogs and again a bit of a soccer uh, that I play uh, outside in the compound, whosoever is available. We have a basketball, uh, uh, basketball court outside uh, uh, just behind the embassy within the compound and also the tennis court and uh, table tennis uh, table upstairs. So pretty much uh, juggling between all of that we try to do and this sums up. Uh, so it is not only the, the diplomatic duties that keep us busy, 
but uh, you know attending national day receptions meeting ministers explaining to them our thought process strategize uh, on going forward uh, as to how best we can take our relationship uh, how to get more economic content the world is oriented now more towards economic diplomacy rather than the cultural diplomacy so yeah we try to get in all those elements into our relationship and of course there are some files to sign an internal administrative paper that takes care of the day So let's go even before that. So what made you want to become you know, a diplomat as someone who works in this field? It's uh, actually really hard work. So you were <laughs> always traveling with your family. Yeah. So what made you choose this This is career? not the first time I'm asked this question, but uh, my, 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 my answer has remained the study. Uh, that, you know, when you are growing up, at least, uh, I used to read a lot of books, personally speaking. Right. I feel books are the best companion to, to any person. If you are with the books, you are with a friend, you are with a philosopher, you are with a guide, you are with a guru, you are the teacher. Uh, so yeah, we used to read uh, lots of books. And back then, you know, the travel was something which was a luxury. Of course. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, things were not as rosy as... And the world was a different place. Uh, travel was considered to be the luxury. And uh, second thing, is that whenever we used to see, you know, those ceremonies uh, on, on the television, you would see, you know, a huge pageantry of uh, a president or a king of a queen uh, coming in a convoy. Right. And whenever you asked, I asked my father, well, who makes the arrangements for this? He says, well, Ministry of External Affairs. Uh, Ministry of External Affairs, that back then didn't make much sense. And uh, as we went along, uh, we saw the summits, the, uh, you know, all of this. And that, uh, if you recall, uh, periods of uh, 17 and 60s were the time when, 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 when the world uh, geopolitics was at a different stage. So diplomacy took uh, a lot of, lot of uh, front stage. And you would see lots of summit level meetings uh, uh, between the leaders. So that encouraged me, is it possible that, uh, you know, uh, if I could also be part of this whole setup. And that encouraged me to embark upon a career uh, and fortunately or luckily, I was able to get into the Foreign Service uh, back then in '85, and incrementally I have made my way up here. Uh, so yes, uh, I would say it has always been my, my, my uh, ambition and I'm thankful to God, I'm thankful to my family, I'm thankful to everyone who has, uh, has, has played a role in making me join this career and I'm proud of it. That's a wonderful history. So uh, you came to Mongolia as an ambassador last year. That's correct. So Not last the, year, let me correct you. I came uh, in 2019. Of course, 2019. <laughs> I always, I we thought it was 2020 that. today. <laughs> so uh, during these two years, uh, what was the difficult part of working in Mongolia? I mean, most of the people say it would be the weather. And what was the most pleasant part of working in Mongolia? Well, I would say, normally people say, okay, good things first or bad thing first. Uh, so I'll say good things first. Of course. <laughs> As I told you, you know, my first visit to Mongolia back then, 99, uh, attracted me to the Mongolian culture. And uh, uh, coming to uh, Mongolia uh, is something that, that, uh, that helped me uh, also bring in connect with the nature. And you said, what is the best part? I say uh, the best part of Mongolia is the people are wonderful. Hospitality is exceptional. There is a bonding of heart. And the feeling uh, that is the genuinely welcome feeling that you get from Mongolians is something that you don't get in many places. Whether, uh, well, I wouldn't say weather is bad, but once you get used to it, uh, weather is nice. 
And what makes it more uh, uh, attractive is the sunshine. I posted, I was posted to Toronto where the temperatures were again minus 20 and all. But the days were very gloomy. You looked right. out, you looked out to a dark sky, a muggy environment. But here, when you look out, it's a bright, brightly shining, sunny, an eternal blue sky. Wherever you go, you know, in winter you see, you know, a layer of white. And when you travel in, in, in summers, you see the layer of green. So much of the traditions that I've seen up here, just as the snuff bottle uh, and other things uh, that, uh, you know, I would say I call them pleasant are many customs. Like for example, Humi and the Moringhor uh, are something that have uh, a place of eternal heritage in Mongolia. Now, coming to the worst part, I now there's nothing I could say worst part, but uh, only thing I wish is that Mongolia should have more roads and uh, <laughs> more is it difficult flights, to travel more to? flights. Right. That was the only, I would say, uh, unpleasant part for me. Uh, traveling roads and off-roads uh, is something that takes a lot of your time and also, uh, I would say, uh, uh, much of the comfort. But other than that, uh, I think uh, in every which way I can call Mongolia as a very pleasant, warm, welcoming uh, nation. Uh, especially for Indians, it has the bond of hearts. We have the shared heritage of Buddhism, and that makes us uh, not only the third neighbor, but the spiritual neighbors as well. So today is Lunar New Year. So thank you for honoring us with the, by wearing our traditional costume. So where did you had it made? Well, um, I was traveling to Hoft province right. for a commercial uh, uh, project uh, inauguration. And that project was being done by uh, uh, by an Indian company, and I ended up uh, uh, in the evening. And uh, suddenly, in the evening, uh, a person came and took my measurements. He says, "I want uh, to take your measurements." I couldn't understand as to why. Right. And uh, the next evening, when I was at the, at the at the dinner, this gentleman brings me this half tail, and uh, I asked him, uh, you know. It was very sweet and wonderful of him. And uh, then I asked him, why did you pick up only this color? And then he responded to me, well, I always see you wearing uh, red the red color. Right. <laughs> no. uh, as I say, no. So uh, that's how I got it made. And so it is with me. And other than this, I do have uh, the summer deal and uh, the winter deals with me. Well, which I, the red most which I wear on the special occasions. I see. Yeah, like Nadam, like Sagan Sar, or if I go to a, an official event where uh, I need to be in the commercial, oh, uh, sorry, traditional attire, then I'll use that. I see. So, speaking of uh, traditional New Year's, uh, does India, uh, what uh, celebration is India's most similar to the Mongolian Lunar New Year? Well, I would say that uh, India has is a land of festival. It's land of, uh, it's a continental nation. Uh, right. with the kind of uh, states that we have. But there is one festival that stands out uh, in celebration, something like your own Sagam Tsar, is Diwali. It's right. the festival of lights. Uh, this uh, festival uh, marks uh, the return of uh, Lord Drama from his uh, victory over the evil Ravana. When he came back to his kingdom, people lit the lights and started celebrating. And it is uh, it is uh, something that goes uh, way back. It's in uh, it's in the epic. Uh, it is written. So this epic has given way to uh, what we call as Diwali, which is more or less uh, you can say the New Year for 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 the traditional or conservative uh, uh, Indians back then. And it continues to be a very important festival, where all of the ledgers and all of the books are closed. Uh, Accounts are written afresh starting uh, the new right. year. Prayers at home, prayers at the temples are held. The, the, just like you have few days, uh, people gather together, they exchange sweets, they exchange gifts. Just as you do, uh, the elder gave gifts to, give gifts to the younger one. Right. And the younger one seek blessings from their elder one. So yeah, Diwali is that festival, I can say, which comes closest to the second Tsar. Oh, when is it celebrated? <coughs> Diwali is celebrated around October and November. I see. Yeah, I mean, just close to the new year. Of course, we do celebrate, uh, the younger generation do celebrate uh, the new year. But right, I would right. say more focus is always towards Diwali.
Well, uh, you asked me about my hobbies and I told you that uh, reading is something uh, that comes close to my heart and this is a habit that I picked up when I was young and I told you uh, about the books are your best companion. You are never alone when you are with the books. Uh, and they conjure up the whole of image that you can imagine, that you can see. And as a matter of fact, if you want to see uh, a place but you have not been, uh, read a book. And uh, so yes, uh, reading books is something that remains a passion for me. Uh, books of all kinds, whether it is philosophy, fiction, uh, science, or uh, general, uh, especially history. Uh, that uh, was one of my subjects when I was uh, in high school. And uh, that's where I got attracted to know more and more about the different civilizations, different people, different cultures, different customs. And uh, that is uh, perhaps one of the reasons that has brought me to this wonderful, wonderful uh, 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 country, uh, I would say, uh, the eternal blue sky and something uh, that nature you can see uh, without any without any obstruction. Um, yes, uh, off late you asked me what I'm reading. I'm reading right now. Uh, I would reading Harari's uh, book, Noel Harari's book, uh, *Sapiens: A Brief History of Humankind*, and it talks about the genesis of uh, mankind, starting from the Stone Age. Uh, to the 21st century, essentially focusing on the homo sapiens, uh, the evolution, how the societies uh, evolved and how the concepts evolved. Uh, so yeah, and another book uh, which, uh, 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 which I'm parallelly reading is An Idea of Justice by Amratya Sen, a Nobel laureate, is an Indian uh, origin person settled in US who wrote uh, uh, about inequalities and the welfare economics in his book called Idea of Justice. I had finished reading uh, Jack Weatherford's uh, uh, the second uh, book, uh, Mongol Queens. And of course I have read, uh, as I told you earlier, about the secret history of Mongolian uh, empire. Uh, there's echoes of empire that I have read uh, before coming here. And uh, one thing which I'm rereading in today's context, if you have seen the world geopolitics is, is at a, at a stage where everything is in a state of flux. So I uh, am rereading two books by George Orwell. One is uh, 1984, if um, you are aware. It, it, it shows you know, how the technology would take over the world and how everyday life would be impacted uh, so much. He never thought that technology would advance so much, but still it is topical. So yeah, uh, that, that keeps uh, me busy. And I told you more, I'm a traditional book reader. Uh, other hobby is, uh, uh, as I showed you, is uh, collecting uh, Buddhas and plates uh, from different parts of the world. Uh, well, I have traveled very extensively, uh, almost uh, 107 countries, including Mongolia, till about uh, 2020. And uh, I hope to cover some more when I get more time and when travel restrictions are eased. And uh, this uh, hobby of picking up uh, a statue of Buddha from each of the country is, uh, uh, has been with me for a while. And these are not all the statues that I've collected, except that I have little place uh, to keep them. So you saw that in the prayer room back there uh, and here. Uh, so yeah, each one of uh, uh, Buddha's personality is depicted differently depending upon the culture and custom of that particular country. If you look at uh, Buddha from Thailand, Buddha from Sri Lanka, Buddha from Mongolia, Buddha from Japan, Buddha from uh, Nepal, Buddha from Bhutan, each of them has a different uh, personification of uh, Lord Buddha. And it is not that Lord Buddha was different, but each one uh, uh, envisions him as a different personality, as a different compassionate person. Uh, so yeah, but that's very close to my heart. Uh, so you saw Thangkas up there, you saw Buddha paintings, uh, you saw Buddha statues and uh, God permit uh, me uh, the will and I would like to keep collecting more and perhaps one day uh, I'll, I'll, I'll donate them to a place where, uh, where these could be placed for more people to see.
that is when time comes. With these few questions, I would like to more, more focus on your personality. So, uh, when I first saw you and saw your name, The Sink, I knew that you were the follower of Sikhism. So, uh, I myself is uh, really interested in martial arts, and I heard that Sikh faith is itself is, you know, follows the martial tradition really That's strictly. Right. So, uh, are you a warrior? <laughs> well, <laughs> your body most certainly looks like a warrior. You will give me the You're sobri. Huge. You will give me the title of uh, ambassador warrior. No, I don't want like to. Uh, <laughs> but yes, uh, I belong to the Sikh faith. Uh, the Sikh faith uh, is about 550 years old, uh, propounded by the first Guru, Guru Nanak Dev Ji, in memory of whom we have created a, a garden here in the National Park by planting 550 trees. Right. And uh, yes, as, uh, as you grow up, uh, we have this tradition of martial arts. So when we were growing, when you uh, are growing up, I think you naturally get, uh, uh, I would say, invited to learn your own traditions, customs. Right. And uh, the Sikhs have the customs, uh, which are little different. Sikhs are the martial race. So as a martial race, uh, generally, uh, there is a sect called Nihangs. They always wear blue clothes, something like that you are wearing. Oh. So they live like uh, warriors. Uh, they are, all their life uh, is learning about weapons and weaponry. And uh, they dedicate themselves to uh, the faith. Uh, so there is a big, uh, how do I say, ashram or a, a place in Punjab where Nihangs are there. And as a general practice, uh, the boys and the girls, they pick up uh, the art of uh, Gatka. And you asked about Chakram. Chakram is only one part of this tradition called Gatka. Gatka is an overarching term which includes uh, different forms of fighting. It includes uh, the sword, it includes the spear, it includes uh, the Chakram, it includes the hammer and all of those uh, and the sticks. So much of that fascinates and uh, for me particular, I would say not as much as Chakram, but uh, the sword. Uh, there is uh, something that I learned a little bit about that uh, when I was young in the age of about 10 to 12. And it continued and uh, it con remains as a hobby, but of late I have not been able to practice it. But uh, whenever I get a chance to see or to involve myself uh, to participate in the Katka competition, which is done every year in Punjab. And uh, I forgot to tell you, the biggest part of this whole uh, martial thing is uh, the horse. As in Mongolia, right. as in India, the horse is an integral part. And the best part uh, or the best uh, thing what uh, we do uh, or the Nihangs do in India is as a part of uh, annual exercise, there is a competition which involves not only the weaponry, but also your skills on the horse. So the pegging or riding simultaneously on the two running horses is right. something that is very, That's very popular. That's actually really interesting. And of course, here is the archery, but where you stand up and you balance and then you do the thing. So yeah, I would say there's much more common element in this regard with Mongolia than anywhere else. So I saw the Nihang you mentioned, they wear their chakram on their turbans. 
So speaking of turbans, uh, would you kindly tell us about uh, why do Sikh, is, uh, Sikh people wear turbans and uh, why, uh, you always wear red? Does the color have any particular meaning? Well, thank you for asking this question. Again, this question, as I told you, was asked to me uh, many, many times. But right. then uh, I'd say in Sikh faith, there are five elements that you have to keep. And uh, keeping your hair uncut is one of the parts. Right. And keeping a small symbolic kirpan or the sword with you is another. I see. And uh, so, yes, uh, since, you know, you don't cut your hair, I have never cut my hair in my life. And, uh, in your life? In my life. All, so all, sick really people, all sick people, I would say most sick people, rather all some have done now, most sick people, uh, most of all, will keep their hair uh, uncut. In, right. That includes the female and the men. Uh, so, you know, when you have a long hair, you put them in a, in a, in a kind of, uh, of, in a fashion, and uh, uh, that, that covers your head. I so see. this headgear, this is called, uh, uh, is called uh, turban or pagri, you know. Uh, I mean, in, back in India, in our place, we call it as, uh, the crown of the Sikh people. I see. Uh, so, yeah, this is to uh, uh, cover my head in a presentable manner and to also make it more, look more presentable uh, in terms of what I keep, the beard and all. So, so what this about is the how. Beard? Do you cut the beard? No, never. Never? Never. <laughs> Nice. And again, the good part is, uh, I think most people believe that if you uh, don't cut it, they'll grow very long. No. If you don't cut it, after a while, they stop growing. I see. And when you cut it, it's uh, against the nature, so they'll grow more. Uh, but the way I see it, if I had, uh, if I had, uh, had an continuous to have a growth of hair, it should have been touching <laughs> the ground, but <laughs> not anymore. They're just up here. So this turban is, uh, is, 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 I would say, a symbol or a crown of Sikh faith and uh, the color does not have any significance except that I prefer personally red color so I always keep it. I see. So uh, what other hobbies do you have? I've heard that you collect Buddhas. <laughs> would you tell us more about that? Uh, I think one of your friends would have told you she came home and uh, yes uh, as a personal belief uh, I have a little place in my uh, in my home which we always call it as a prayer room. And that mm -hmm. is not only for me. I have kept articles of faith from every single faith, whether it is Christianity, Muslim, uh, Buddhism, Jainism, or my own faith. But as a part of the corner, as I told you, I have been traveling a lot, and uh, I used to collect uh, Buddhas and the plates. So I, uh, yes, I have now a collection of about, what, 23 plus Buddhas from different countries, each of the Buddhist countries, wherever I could get. Uh, my other, uh, I wouldn't say passion, but which has been continuing is, uh, is that I love to read books. So yeah, that right. uh, is something uh, that I, I, I keep. And of course, things have now moved on from books in physical form to Kindle. But I'm still uh, a typical person who prefers uh, uh, the books physical, to, the, right. uh, to, to the Kindle. So I would like to talk about the history of our two nations, more about the culture of Sikhism. But unfortunately, our time has reached for the program. And uh, I really hope that uh, we will have the time to talk more about this in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, as I say, my, my, my thankful, uh, uh, thankfulness to the Mongolian national uh, broadcast world, MNB world, as you call it for having me here in your studios and I certainly look forward to interacting more with you uh, with a view to share my uh, unique experiences of living in Mongolia and it is such a pleasure that I am joining you during Sagansar. My best wishes to all the viewers uh, Sagansar. May you have uh, a safe, healthy uh, New Year and celebrate safely with your family and friends. Thank you for that. Okay. So uh, this concludes our today's program. We wish you the best of luck in the upcoming year of the Ox, and we will see you next time with more episodes. Goodbye. Bye-bye.